Bless the Lord of my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name, sing like never before, oh my soul, worship his holy name bless the lord oh my soul oh, oh my soul i worship your holy name i sing like never before Oh, my soul, I worship your holy name. Hello, this is Pastor Bella, Alex Dosagye, Lagos, Nigeria. Good evening, God girls. That is the song in my spirit right now. I am so excited, as usual, that we are getting to the conclusion, the conclusion of On the Road to Goshen. My, my, my. It's been a wonderful journey, a truly, truly wonderful journey. I have been encouraged. I have been uplifted. I have been so in awe of God studying the life of Joseph, and God is just amazing. He's told us in his word that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, so don't just look at him as an Old Testament God. He is the same God. He is so precious, so wonderful, and he just wants to know you, and he wants you to know him, and please draw close to God. God has great things for you, but he's going to take you through some painful things. It doesn't mean he's wicked, but he has created you for a certain purpose. And for you to truly rise and shine in your purpose, you must understand pain. You cannot go out into the world and shine without going through pain, because then you will have pride. You will be ministering to people or speaking to people from a place of pride because you haven't been through that pain. Pain breaks you. Pain brings you to a place of humanity and compassion. You will become more compassionate when you've been through tough situations and been through pain. And as children of God, we're called to be ministers of God. It doesn't mean you have to be a pastor or an evangelist or an apostle, but as a child of God, once you stand up and say, I'm a Christian, I'm a God girl, you are already an ambassador for Christ. You are witnessing for Christ. The world needs to see Christ in you. So when you go out into the world and say you're a Christian, how can you be an effective Christian? You need to have gone through some things. You need to have experienced some disappointment, some challenges that will make you grow stronger in Christ. There's a saying that says experience is the best teacher because the truth is when you go through a lot of experiences in life, you come out wiser unless you just just want to be stupid and not learn from what you've been through. When you come out wiser, that's experience. But To me, experience is not the best teacher. The Holy Spirit is the best teacher. Even if you're someone who doesn't know God and you have so much life experience, you cannot offer the best to the world if the Holy Spirit is not in you. So God, girls, crave for more of the Holy Spirit. Build a friendship with Him and listen to Him. He encourages you. He He is so beautiful. The Spirit of God is so, so beautiful. And He's the one that empowers us with all these spiritual gifts to go out and manifest in our generation. I had a crazy 24 hours from Tuesday night into Wednesday. I had one of the God girls physically with me yesterday. And she could see that, okay, Pastor Bella is a little spaced out. You know, because it was just crazy. Little things just happening. Little 
little things and big things. A big thing happened Tuesday night. I'm not going to share that with you, but it really threw me off. Okay, I gave that to God, but it was still bugging me, so I hadn't totally given it to God, right? Yeah, the flesh and the spirit, the flesh and the spirit. It was still bugging me, and it right into Wednesday, and I had to go take care of some stuff, ministry stuff on Wednesday, and on the way back, I get a call from my son's school that he has a tummy ache, and I'm like, from where, how, what happened? He was fine this morning, so I need to figure out how to get to his school right quick and check on him. And as I'm getting to his school right quick, the person who's driving my car, I don't know if he fell asleep at the wheel or something, but he bumps into the car right in front of him. And so that shook me up like, what in the world? He's driven me several times. Why today an accident? So I put all these together and it it was really getting me highly stressed because remember I was still processing what happened to me Tuesday night and I took that with me into Wednesday and so with everything else going on with Jaden's tummy ache and the car accident and I was like oh lord oh lord oh lord oh lord help me lord help me and he just started ministering to me I started receiving new songs from the Holy Spirit yes and I was reminded of older songs you know and um that I hadn't listened to in years and that's why I take time out to talk to you all about secular music that seriously, just ask God to help you remove secular music from from you because God speaks to you through music. He'll give you new songs from heaven if he has blessed you with that gift or he would encourage you with your music playlist. He can, you can just be feeling so down and then you'll be here. There was a time I was feeling so down and I got what a friend we have in Jesus, you know, and of course I grew up with that hymn, but that day, do you know what resonated with me? Everything to God in prayer, we have to take everything, it's take everything to God in prayer, and it is such a privilege that you can carry everything to God in prayer. So he will minister to you with music. And that's how he started comforting me. Yesterday, between the time I got my son, I had to go back and get my daughter. I just started praying and speaking in tongues. I said, Holy Spirit, I need your power because I'm really disturbed by a lot of things that are going on. And I need you to help me focus and just help me. And his peace and his strength took over. And then... I started to understand why the enemy was angry because I'm going into another aspect of ministry, which was what I was taking care of yesterday. And another aspect that God has laid on my heart to do, which I plan to launch this month. And the enemy is raging. And that's another way I know I'm on the right path. Many times when I'm getting attacked like that, even when I was on the flight back to Nigeria after 16 years in the States, When I was heading back to Nigeria, that was the worst flight ever. The turbulence was out of this world. The turbulence was continuous. It was continuous throughout that flight. I think we only had like two hours of a good time. It was a horrible, horrible flight. I mean, I heard people saying their last prayers. You know the prayer you would pray if you think you're going to die? Yeah. People were just screaming and saying, oh, Lord, you know. And, of course, I was just not, mm mm-mm. I was really not into it. I'm not someone that, if I could get anywhere, everywhere by road, I would. I I really don't like going up. I don't like the planes. I don't like elevators. I don't like the amusement park. Yes, I have a thing with heights. So that's one of the reasons I admire Super Bumi so much because she's a military god girl and uh, she's up in the skies flying planes. Woohoo! Good for her. I can't fly a plane and I really don't want to be on a plane, but it's unfortunate I need to get on a plane to get to some parts of the world, right? So that flight was horrible. And that's how I knew that the enemy didn't want me to come to Nigeria. Because what God wanted me to do, where was a place of my purpose, was where I was heading to. So the enemy was fighting me. So that's a sign that you would know that the devil is coming for you. When he's attacking you consistently, you're on you're on the right. And God has laid stuff on your heart and you're doing it. Oh, yeah, yeah, the devil's coming for you. So... Anyways, God is good, and God is awesome, and I just praise the Lord. All right, so let's conclude 
on the road to Goshen. And I've told you what Goshen is, right? That special place that God has created for you in a land. And Egypt was a foreign land to the children of Israel. The children of Israel were Hebrews and the Egyptians they didn't like them, right? They didn't like their occupation as shepherds. So they're walking into a place of discrimination or maybe indifference or, you know, it really wasn't a conducive place, right? But God took them there and gave them a treasured place, the place of rest, a place where they could prosper and multiply as God had told Abraham for the nation of Israel to grow, 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 grow right there in Goshen. So that's Goshen. And he had raised Joseph up for this specific purpose to make sure that Joseph goes ahead to create a place in Egypt where the children of Israel, the nation of Israel can grow in strength and in numbers. That's what Joseph was raised up for. But in order for him to do that, he had to go through some things. And that's why we discussed Joseph in six parts. And now we're finally wrapping up his story. All right. God is faithful. We're going into chapter 48 of Genesis. So Jacob is about to die. And normally when the father is about to die, he's going to bless the children. So Jacob tells Joseph to bring his sons. And it's just a beautiful relationship between Jacob and Joseph, how Jacob defers to Joseph and brings him in and talks to him man to man that, hey, you know, this is what God told me in verse four. Behold, I will make you fruitful and multiply you and I will make of you a multitude of people and give this land to your descendants after you as an everlasting possession. It does not end. It's forever. And now your two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, who were born to you in the land of Egypt before I came to you in Egypt, are mine. As Reuben and Simeon, they shall be mine. Your offspring whom you beget after them shall be yours. They will be called by the name of their brothers in their inheritance. So basically, Jacob is telling Joseph that Ephraim and Manasseh, who are actually Joseph's sons, and who Joseph should reserve a blessing for as his sons, what Jacob is doing, he's going to do the blessing for them because they will actually be part of the tribes of Israel. Okay, so Jacob is performing the blessing for Ephraim and Manasseh, saying, these are mine. Basically, these are going to be part of the 12 tribes of Israel. How cool is that? It's really, I find it cool in case you don't. So the Bible says that his eyes are dim with age. That's Jacob in verse 10. So he couldn't really see. So he's telling Joseph to bring them to him so he can bless them. And the Bible says in verse 13, and Joseph took them both, Ephraim with his right hand, towards Israel's left hand, and Manasseh with his left hand towards Israel's right hand. But I want you to watch what happens here. And then Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it on Ephraim's head, who was the younger, and his left hand on Manasseh's head, guiding his hands knowingly, for Manasseh was the firstborn. And he blessed Joseph and said, God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has fed me all my life long to this day, the angel who has redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads. Let my name be among them and the name of my fathers Abraham and Isaac and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. Now when Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand on the head of Ephraim, it displeased him. So he took hold of his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head to Manasseh's head. And Joseph said to his father, Not so, my father, for this one is the firstborn. Put your right hand on his head. But his father refused and said, I know, my son, I know. He also shall become a people, and he also shall be great. But truly, his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his descendants shall become a multitude of nations. So he blessed them that day, saying, By you Israel will bless, saying, May God make you as Ephraim and as Manasseh. And thus he set Ephraim before Manasseh. Um, God just does things in an interesting way, right? Now, Jacob was pretty much almost blind, so he really couldn't see their faces. And Joseph directed the, <laughs> the, the sons correctly, right, so that the older one 
would be touched with the right hand to receive the blessing. But is uh, Jacob, who couldn't see, the Spirit of God ministered to him, and he was able to switch his hands so that he could... <laughs> Give the greater blessing to the younger one instead of the older one. And the Bible says Joseph was displeased. Again, remember when I said for 22 years, Jacob had no idea that Joseph was alive, right? So here again, Joseph has no idea that his younger son, Ephraim, is going to be greater than his older son, Manasseh. There are just some things that God will never, ever, ever reveal to you until he decides to, or he will reveal it through someone else. And it's up to you to be teachable and to know within your spirit when you are receiving a word that is of God. So, of course, Joseph knows that his father is a man of God, and he knows that, oh, okay, God must have revealed this to my father Jacob, so I'm going to accept it. Ephraim, my younger son, it will be greater than Manasseh up until this point. I didn't know that. Okay, so God is interesting and God is deep in the way he reveals things to us. God is awesome. Okay, so let's go to chapter 49. Chapter 49, now Jacob is getting ready to bless all his sons. Sons of Leah, sons of Rachel, sons of Bilhah, sons of Zilpah. Remember those maids that were given to Jacob to have more children with? Yeah, Jacob really had a hard life. A colorful life. I kind of feel sorry for him. He really went through a lot emotionally, mentally, and even physically. He had to fight for his blessings, really. I mean, he literally had to wrestle God to be blessed. <laughs> so it's it was a hard life for him, even though God chose him. It was a hard life for him. So don't expect life to be a cakewalk just because God chose you for a specific purpose. You're going to go through stuff, so you need to ask God for the grace, the strength, and the endurance to finish your race well. I'm not going to go through all the blessings here because I'm just going to point out some key things to you. Number one is the blessing of Reuben. Reuben, you are my firstborn. This is verse 3. My might and the beginning of my strength, the excellence of dignity and the excellence of power, unstable as water. You shall not excel because you went up to your father's bed, then you defiled it. He went up to my couch. I mean, this is horrible. Reuben, the first son of Jacob, and of course, you know, he was Leah's son because Rachel was barren for a long while. That's when the maids were given in to start having children for Jacob, right? Bilhah and Zilpah. So in Genesis chapter 35, right after Rachel had died, in verse 22, the Bible says, Then Israel journeyed and pitched his tent beyond the tower of Eda. He probably needed some time to mourn for his wife. So right after he buried Rachel, Israel went on a journey. Israel, who's Jacob, right? He went on a journey. And while he was away, while he was away, Reuben went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine, and Israel heard about it. Bilhah was Rachel's maidservant. When Rachel was barren, she gave her maidservant to Jacob to have children. Okay? And Bilhah had two sons for Jacob, Dan and Naphtali, before Rachel's womb was opened. So, but this is kind of sickening, right? that Reuben would go and sleep with a woman who has had children for his father. It's the utmost disrespect. You see, the word defile is used. Sexual purity is important to God. It's very important. For Reuben to do such a thing, he grieved God and he grieved his father. And the Bible says Israel heard about it, but did Israel do anything about it then? No, I don't think he did anything. But now, now, which is the crucial point in a man's life your father is about to die and you are his firstborn there is a blessing for you remember the story of Jacob and Esau what Jacob had to do so that he could steal that birthright there is a blessing in the birthright for the first son but because of this sin that Reuben committed sleeping with a woman who has slept with his father and had children for his father that's 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 just that's abominable. That's like utmost disrespect. Your father is in mourning for Rachel, right? Wife number two, right? And 
I don't know what was his thought process. Oh, dad is away, so I'm going to go sleep with Bill, huh? Does that even make sense? Can't you get a wife? Or I, I'm just, I don't understand his thought process. But that was when he lost his birthright. So God, girls, be careful. There are consequences to actions. Once you know the truth of the word of God, do not deliberately disobey God. You will pay for it. If you don't pay in that moment, in the future, you will pay for it. There will be a consequence if you disobey God. The eternal consequence of disobedience to God is going to hell. There is a consequence. So at this crucial time when Jacob is blessing all his sons, well, Reuben, you missed out because huh, you missed out big time. So that blessing of the firstborn, guess where it ended up? Yes, with our man, Joseph. It ended up with Joseph, not with Reuben, but with Joseph. God is just amazing. If we can just serve him truthfully and faithfully and do what he tells us to do, we will receive his blessings. All right? So you can read through the blessings of the other sons, but I want to concentrate on Joseph. In verse 22, Joseph is a fruitful bow, a fruitful bow by a well. His branches run over the wall. The archers have bitterly grieved him, shot at him, and hated him. But his bow remained in strength, and the arms of his hands were made strong. When adversity is coming at you, you're going to get stronger. It's terrible, I know, but you will get stronger. Your trials actually make you stronger in Christ. So God is blessing Joseph because of all that he went through. All that he went through, this, this is the blessing that Jacob would have probably given to Reuben as the firstborn. But no, 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 no. It was reserved for Joseph, the one that they threw away and sent into slavery. I remember Reuben. Reuben was going to be the one to come back and save Joseph from the pit. But one thing Jacob says in his blessing is, Reuben, you're unstable as water. What stopped Reuben back then as the leader, the firstborn of all those wicked sons, to say, no, let's not kill Joseph? Why couldn't he voice it out? It shows that he was not a leader. Someone else stepped up and came up with another idea. That was Judah. Judah was like, instead of killing him, let's just sell him. That is a leader. A leader speaks up. So you have a choice. Do you want to be a Reuben or do you want to be a Judah? Step up and be a leader. Speak out. You know, speak out. And you can read the blessings of Judah too and see that, yeah, Judah was really, really, really blessed. Because as I told you, King David came from the tribe of Judah. Jesus came from the tribe of Judah. It is an everlasting covenant that God has with Judah that the scepter will never depart from him. Rulership will continue in that tribe, even through eternity. So that's amazing. All right. So Joseph is being blessed exceedingly by his father verse 26 the blessings of your father have excelled the blessings of my ancestors up to the utmost bound of the everlasting hills they shall be on the head of joseph and on the crown of the head of him who was separate from his brother so he has the majority of the blessings from jacob and you know what joseph deserves it forget the fact that he was the favorite son and he was lost for 22 years he was truly a faithful man of God. And a faithful man of God, a woman of God, deserves the best, right? So Joseph got the best blessing from Jacob. But as you know, there is no tribe of Joseph. There's no tribe of Joseph. The tribes of Israel continue through Ephraim and Manasseh. Joseph was not a tribe. He fulfilled his destiny, fulfilled his purpose, and that was it. That was it. Isn't that amazing? Like Joseph was not a tribe? Yeah. It continued through his two sons. So God does what he does. Just yield. Just obey. And the funny thing too is, as the Spirit of God ministered to Jacob to bless the younger son, there was no argument from Jacob like, Lord, what? You don't bless the younger son? You know, there was no argument. Jacob just switched his hands. And that's where God wants to take you and I. That blind obedience, obedience, it, does, it doesn't have to make sense to you. It doesn't have to make sense to you. You know, God has given you a directive, follow it. So Jacob didn't even have time to argue with God. He just switched his hands and blessed the younger son. But that's it. 
God ministered to him to do that. So let's not argue with God. When God gives a directive, go with it because God is sovereign and God's plan is greater and bigger than what your eyes can even see. Just obey. So goes on in verse 29 to tell us that Jacob is dead. All right. Remember when shortly before Jacob went into Egypt to meet with Joseph, God told him that, let me go back there right quick. God told him that I will go down with you to Egypt and I will also surely bring you up again. Meaning you're going to Egypt now. You will be reconciled with Joseph, but you're going to die there and I'll bring you up out of there. So Jacob is telling them in verse 29 of chapter 49, I am to be gathered to my people, bury me with my fathers in the cave that is in the field of Ephron the Hittite. So, Jacob was not buried in Egypt. Verse 33, Jacob passes away. In chapter 50, Joseph falls on his father's face, weeps over him, mourns for his father. Thank goodness God gave Joseph and Jacob 17 more years together before Jacob passed away. God is faithful, and we have to thank him. We have to thank him for how he uses us and how he blesses us. And whatever God takes us through, let's just be faithful to God. So Joseph goes to tell the Pharaoh that, in verse 5, My father made me swear, saying, Behold, I am dying in in my grave, which I dug for myself in the land of Canaan. There you shall bury me. Now, therefore, please let me go up and bury my father, and I will come back. I wanted to draw your attention to this. Okay? Humility. At this point, Joseph was really ruling Egypt. He was the man in charge. He was the one in charge. He had been given so much power by the Pharaoh. So much power. Yet, Joseph did not just get up and do whatever he wanted to do. There was an orderliness with him. He still deferred to the Pharaoh. And I just love this character in the Bible so much because I see what happens in churches. Just give someone a little power. Just make them a leader of some group and then just watch what happens. It's implosive. It's explosive. That little pride, they start to feel like, ooh, I'm better. I'm better. And then they feel I'm a leader, so I don't need to tell the overseer, you know, whoever put them in their leadership position, maybe the pastor of the church puts you as the youth leader, and now you feel like, oh, I'm a leader, so I don't need to run things by the pastor. It happens a lot. But you don't see that happening with Joseph. With all the power that he had, he still went to the Pharaoh and said, my father has passed away. This is what my father said. He doesn't want to be buried here. Please, may I go and bury my father? I mean, there's so much to learn from this man. No matter how powerful or famous or whoever you become, please remember that you are a human being and you have only attained that by the grace of God. Don't ever be full of yourself. Don't ever be full of pride. Just be humble. Be open. Be open with your leaders. If a leader elevates you and you're reporting to somebody, don't start doing shady things. Don't start coming up with directives and feeling like, oh, yeah, you know, I'm a leader now. You have to run things by your leader. That's respect. That's orderliness. So, as I said, we're on the road to Goshen, but I'm pulling out some things here and there that you should learn from. All right? So, of course, the Pharaoh gives him permission to go bury his father. And it's amazing how God raised Joseph was basically the second to the last son one of the youngest sons of Jacob but God raised him as the leader everyone was now deferring to Joseph remember those two dreams all his brothers were deferring to him and that's what God does he will exalt you I understand your life has been hard and you feel people are disrespecting you or people have written you off or whatever 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 Don't turn away from God because it's only God that can turn your situation around. And there are times you will go through really hard seasons. Before Joseph got to this point, where was he? Yeah, we took time to study Joseph so that you can see that there are tears on the road to Goshen. There's heartbreak. There's heartbreak. Your heart will be broken so that you can understand the pain of people. And I don't know how it's going to be broken, but it's going to be broken. Either through illness, relationship, 
Something is going to break your heart. Something is going to bring you down a little to understand the pain of humanity. You need to understand it as a child of God because how can you minister or be compassionate with people? How can you care about people if you haven't experienced the pains of life? So in the path to purpose, on the road to your Goshen, where God is going to situate you and bless you, you're still going to go through stuff. But the lesson here is to hold on to God in all seasons. In the good season... While you're sitting up in the palace of the Pharaoh ruling, don't forget God. While you're in the jail cell, don't forget God. While you're the head honcho slave in Potiphar's house and things are looking kind of good, even though you're still a slave, don't forget God. Because if Joseph, as I've told you before, if Joseph had relaxed in Potiphar's house and felt free, because when you're relaxed and you kind of feel like, oh yeah, I've made it, you are more easily liable to commit sin against God, to fulfill the temptation that the enemy brings your way. But Joseph was guarded up. He was like, mm, Mrs. P right here, she's trying to mess with me and my destiny and my faith in God, and I'm not going to let it happen. So Joseph was guarded up. As children of God, we must stay guarded up because the enemy is coming at you. I just gave you a little testimony of what I was dealing with yesterday. The devil was coming at me from different directions, with the car, with the children, with all kinds of things were going on. But I had to stay focused. I said, Lord, you're the only one that can get me out of this. And then the Holy Spirit started to minister to me, started to minister to me. And that's the way out. I'm telling you, I woke up this morning with more peace in my heart because I've totally surrendered the situation to him. I partially surrendered it to him on Tuesday. That's why I was still worried, right, into Wednesday. But as of yesterday... I've totally surrendered it to him. I'm not going to sit down being bugged out by things I can't control. I'm going to go to the one who controls it all, the one who I'm faithful to and who I love and who my life is in service to. I'm going to give it to him so he can handle it for me. I've given the battle over to God. That's what you must do as a child of God because what can you do? Things are happening. Troubles are coming. What can you do? But God can do it all. So stay in God. Stay prayerful. Keep your faith up and don't let the enemy come in and mess with your mind and shift it away from God. Don't stay worried. Give your burdens and your worry over to God. All right? So, now, 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 now. This is an interesting conclusion to this aspect of Joseph's life. Jacob is dead and gone. Now listen from verse 15 of chapter 50. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, Perhaps Joseph will hate us and may actually repay us for all the evil which we did to him. So they sent messengers to Joseph, saying, Before your father died, he commanded, saying, Thus you shall say to Joseph, I beg you, please forgive the trespass of your brothers and their sin, for they did evil to you. Now please forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of your father. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. If you have done something really, 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 really bad, and you have not handed off that bad thing that you did totally to God, it's going to eat at you for a good long while. And Joseph's brothers, even though they were prospering in Goshen, they felt that Joseph did not deal with them or revenge against them because Jacob was still alive. But now Jacob is dead, so now they're worried and concerned again. They think that, oh, maybe undercover Joseph is still undercover. Maybe he's just been pretending to keep us alive, waiting for Jacob to die so he can take us out, kill us all. And the Bible says Joseph wept because Joseph was a pure heart. It is only a pure heart that can respond with such a pure response to a hardcore, sinful snake of a woman called Mrs. P. It was a pure response from his heart that how can I do this against my master? It was, he, was even, he was even preaching to her. My, my master, who is actually your husband? Your husband is a good man. He's given me so much power in this house. How can I do this to him? And you are a woman who's married to a good man. So what do you need me for? That's a pure heart. 
And then he said, how can I sin against God? That's a pure heart. So Joseph has always had a pure heart. The spirit of God was in Joseph. And so he's weeping that, seriously? My brothers think that I haven't forgiven them? I need to reassure them again. Verse 18, then his brothers also went and fell down before his face, and they said, Behold, we are your servants. Basically, you know what? Don't kill us. We're gonna we're just gonna be your servants, okay? Just don't kill us. Whew, Lord have mercy. Joseph said to them, verse 19, do not be afraid, for am I in the place of God? But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people alive. Now, therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. Joseph was a pure heart. But really, verse 20 is one of my favorite scriptures in the Bible. It's a scripture of understanding your purpose and everything you had to go through. Those bad things that will happen to you on your path to purpose that God allows you to experience, this is the response to it. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. See, when you're going through pain, you think that you're alone. God doesn't care. God doesn't love you. But he's going to take all that pain. He's going to package it into something so beautiful. That's why I say my purpose scripture is Isaiah 61 verse 3. He will exchange all those ashes of pain for his beauty. He's going to make something beautiful out of all that pain. You are going to rise up and shine and glow with Christ who is now in you like never before. You think Joseph would have achieved all this if he had stayed in his father's house, naive with no experience, just being a pure heart with a naive, you know, naive soul? God had to grow him up. But even in all those experiences, he did not depart from God. And that is a lesson to you and I. If we want to get to Goshen and we want to stay in Goshen with Jesus, hey, you better not turn away from Jesus even in the hard times. So he reassures them, that, hey, I'm not going to, no revenge. I can't revenge. When God's hand was in this, when God's hand was in this, how can I revenge? How can I revenge against you? So God, girls, everything that you've been through, those painful things, please ask God to help you forgive. Once you are able to forgive whoever hurts you, there's a sense of freedom and lightness that comes to your spirit. And then you'll understand why God took you through that. You'll understand because he has a purpose for you. And that pain is part of your purpose. God will reveal himself to you and show you how to use that for his glory. That's my life's testimony. It's what God did with me. So I know what I'm talking about. Verse 22, so Joseph dwelt in Egypt, he and his father's household, and Joseph lived 110 years. Joseph saw Ephraim's children to the third generation. The children of Makar, the son of Manasseh, were also brought up on Joseph's knees. So he lived a good long while. And Joseph said to his brethren, I am dying, but God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land to the land of which he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Then Joseph took an oath from the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from here. So Joseph died, being 110 years old, and they embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. This brings us to the end of Joseph, a purpose-driven man. One last thing I want to draw to your attention is Joseph was, what, a dreamer, right? He started out as a dreamer at the age of 17. By the time he got to prison in Egypt after Potiphar's house, he was an interpreter of dreams, right? And then he got to the palace. He was an interpreter of dreams. So he was now a prophetic dreamer and a prophetic interpreter of dreams. But now you see him as a prophet, his prophesying over them telling them that 
God will surely visit them and bring you out of this land to the land which he swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So Joseph is a prophet right now. It's amazing what God does and how he uses you as his willing vessel. God, girls, God can do anything with you. Just be open to God. Just love God. Just trust God. No matter what you're going through, know that Goshen is a special place that has been created for you. And in the midst of adversity and problems and whatever, as long as you have God, as long as you have God, you will prosper where he has planted you. Your case will be different. Receive your Goshen now. Receive it. I prophesy it upon you. Receive your Goshen now. You've struggled and struggled and struggled, but now yield and surrender totally to God and receive your Goshen now. God, girls, God loves you and I love you. This is Pastor Bella, Alex Nosage, Lagos, Nigeria, Ultimate God Girl. God bless you.